Good afternoon. So I, my name is John Salis. I'm with IBM Research, and I'm going to talk about spin diffusion and spin drift in a two-dimensional electron gas. This is a collaboration between our lab and um, the University of São Paulo and the Tohoku University in Sendai, the University of Uberlandia and ETH Zurich. And this came about uh, from sabbatical visits of Felix Hernandez from University of São Paulo, as well as Makoto Koda from Tohoku University to our lab. And um, we have excellent sample materials that is grown for us by the Wegscheider group at ETH of Zürich. So what is uh, spin diffusion and spin drift? Let's first see what electron drift and diffusion is. This is of course well known. This is the basis of information technology. And what you have is you have a diffusion constant and you have a drift velocity. These are the two parameters. And you want to know how the electron density changes as a function of time and position. And the uh, connection between these constants and the electron density is through the diffusion equation, which uh, is a differential equation that has as a Green's function the solution which corresponds to a delta-shaped excitation in space, which is the well-known Gaussian envelope so it's a Gaussian profile of the density of electrons where you see that the width of this Gaussian profile expands with one over square, with what, with square root of time. And um, the center of mass of that profile shifts linearly with time with the given velocity. In addition, you see here that this cloud of electrons dilutes and this dilution is because of the expansion of the electrons and this leads to a 1 over t dependence of this density. This is um, about charge diffusion. If you now go to spin diffusion and spin drift, essentially this is as if you would take a color and paint your electrons with a color, and this color behaves then very similarly to the electron charge, except that this uh, spin density is a vector, so this vector precesses in magnetic fields, and therefore the color changes and what you see here is um, color red and color blue that label spin up and spin down. And you see as this cloud of electrons drifts and diffuses there is a change from red to blue which corresponds to a spin precession in an internal magnetic field induced by spin orbit interaction. So this is the focus of, of this work now that we want to understand this spin orbit field and the pattern that it creates in spin drift and spin diffusion maps. And what the general um, assumption is, is that this spin precession depends only on the position that the electron travels to. So if you excite electrons at position zero, the spin phase is just a function of the position and it doesn't matter on whether this position is arrived at, at an early time or the later time. This corresponds to the horizontal lines in these patterns. And what we see in our experiment is a tilt of this pattern. So we see that quasi-stationary electrons, which means electrons that stay at the same position as a function of time, show some precession. And I will explain where this precession comes from. Yes? Why, why is it symmetric? Why is there this tilt? Yeah. So that will be the central point of my talk. If you, <laughs> if you <laughs> have a little patience, then, then I will come to that. <laughs> so I will relate it to cubic spin orbit interaction. So this is the outline. So I will first um, refresh spin orbit interaction in a two-dimensional electron gas. Uh, I will also go into the two main components, which are the Raschba and the Dresselhaus component. I will then explain how spin orbit interaction uh, represents itself in diffusion and drift. I will talk about spin modes, which are the solutions of the drift, spin drift and spin diffusion equations, and mention a specific spin mode, which is the persistent spin helix. I will then uh, explain our technique with which we measure such spin drift and spin diffusion and then come to the results and the results are that we see a precession of these quasi-stationary spins 
and that we give an explanation with a model, very simple model, and we will see how linear and cubic Dressler spin orbit interactions affect such spin diffusion and spin drift maps. Okay, so spin orbit interaction is a very fundamental effect. It is essentially the transformation of an electric field into the reference frame of a moving electron. And in that reference frame of the moving electron, this electric field has a magnetic component and interacts with the spin. This gives rise to spin splitting in atoms. If you combine atoms into a crystal, it determines the band structure. So, for instance, in silicon or gallium arsenide, you have in the valence band the splitting between the split-off band and the heavy and light hole band. It also changes the effective mass and it influences the g-factor. So this is spin-orbit interaction in bands. What we are considering now is again a step further, which again is simpler, which is the um, behavior of a quasi-free electron in a, in a band. So if you have such a free electron that moves in, let's say, the conduction band with a certain velocity, then again an electric field will lead to a spin-orbit interaction, will lead to an effective magnetic field that interacts with the spin and then can be used to rotate and manipulate the spin. There is uh, two different types of electric fields in such a um, semiconductor uh, electron gas and one of them is just coming from the asymmetry of the surface versus the substrate. So if you have doping or if you apply a gate voltage, you have here a gradient that, that leads to a spin-orbit field, which is the Raspa spin-orbit field. It is characterized by a constant alpha. It is linear in the Fermi wave number. And what is shown here is the Fermi circle. And if you go to a, some point here in the Fermi circle, then what this arrow shows is the direction of the effective magnetic field. You see that this effective magnetic field always points perpendicularly to the right with respect to the velocity on the Fermi circle. There is another electric field and that is the Dresselhaus electric <coughs> field. It has its origin in a bulk inversion asymmetry of the zinc blend crystal, so it's present in gallium arsenide, not in silicon. And um, this electric field from this inversion asymmetry creates a Dresselhaus spin orbit field. There is a linear component that is characterized by a constant beta or beta 1, linear in the Fermi wave number. And if you look how this magnetic field changes as you change the position on the Fermi circle, you see that this arrow here rotates the same way as here, but in the other direction. So this has a different symmetry. These fields can be quite strong, so in gallium arsenide with a density of a few times 10 to the 11 per square centimeters, they are several Tesla, and that leads to a very rapid spin precession. So let's consider now some electrons in real space that have different positions on the Fermi circle, they move into different directions, they see all different magnetic fields, spin-orbit magnetic fields, and therefore on the block sphere, the spin that is originally pointing along the C direction, so on the North Pole, will move into different directions on the block sphere. Now if you have scattering, and you always have electron-electron scattering that um, is fast compared to the time the spin needs to move on the block sphere a significant amount. Then you have a diffusive motion in real space, but also a diffusive motion on the block sphere. You see that in that animation. So as the electrons move around in real space, they also move around on the block sphere. And this leads to a dephasing of a spin ensemble. This is known as the diakonov perel spin dephasing. And it concerns the whole ensemble of spins. But if you look more carefully, you see something interesting. You see that um, this position here in real space somehow is correlated to the position on the block sphere. And this means that if we are able to locally pump spins and locally probe spins, then we get rid, at least partially, of that spin defacing mechanism by Diakonov and Perel. That's one thing. And the other thing is that spin polarization at the some certain point in space um, is given by some direction of, of the spin, so, so we will see a pattern of spin polarization that depends on position. Now let me come back to this dephasing argument, so if we have um, a local measurement of spins at this position for all spins that we initialize here, there is of course different paths with which you can arrive here, and I just show two paths both are composed of two parts, one going to the right and one going backwards. 
What is different is the order. And because of the different order, the spin arrives at different orientations. This is well-known non-commutation of rotation matrices. So um, there is a <coughs> third direction which corresponds to the average spin orientation, which is in plane and 45 degrees to these polarizations. So even if we have a local uh, measurement of our spins, the defacing is not completely um, lifted, but at least partially. And um, what we now want to know is how this spin polarization here depends on the position at which we probe our spins. Now we can just uh, do a simple cartoon here. So all spins here that are excited locally in the middle with a spin up end up here at some distance uh, with an in-plane spin orientation and that is the spin mode. That is essentially the solution of the spin diffusion equation um, with the starting condition of a delta-shaped excitation. You see here calculated spin modes for different spin orbit interactions um, for only a Rashba spin orbit interaction which corresponds more or less to this image here. You see a radially symmetric mode so this white line is spin in plane that corresponds to that situation if the spin diffuses even further then the spin points into the negative C direction. If we now introduce Dresselhaus spin orbit interaction then you see that this a circular shape here is more and more distorted in towards a stripe pattern and at the position this is half Dresselhaus compared to Raspa if we have equal Raspa and Dresselhaus spin orbit interaction then the spin orbit field is unidirectional it only points into the x direction into one direction and then we have a complete stripe pattern but also this precession axis is fixed so there is this argument that rotations do not commute, does not hold anymore, in simple words, and you have completely lifted all the phasing mechanisms. So the spin helix situation, where we have equal Raspa and Dressler spin orbit interaction, lifts this defacing due to non-commutation of, of rotations. Okay, so this is um, for diffusion. Now let's add drift. So if we add drift, then um, of course the center of mass if you want so the oops so the, um, the 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 center of this distribution shifts as a function of time and you can think of a spin that is uh, somewhere here that it has experienced some drift transport but also some diffusive transport so spins that end up on that line have drifted but if they are far off or if they are above or below that line they have diffused in addition. So you can think of, of a spin having some part of its path uh, done with diffusion and some part with drift. And now the assumption is that drift and diffusion, diffusion in linear spin orbit interaction behave completely different, completely the same. So it doesn't matter whether a spin moves a certain distance because of diffusion or because of drift, it's essentially the same. And that means that the assumption is that the spin phase only depends on the position that you end and that there is no precession of spins that stay at the same position. Now we will investigate that with time resolved K rotation measurements. So for that we have a laser with, which is pulsed and we send two pulses onto the, our sample. One that is circular polarized, that is the pump pulse. It creates spins along the C direction of the quantum well. Then we wait some time, the spin uh, changes, it precesses, and then we probe the system with a linearly polarized probe pulse that is delayed some time, and we measure the rotation of the polarization <coughs> axis. This is the K rotation angle, and this is proportional to the spin along the C direction. So by changing the delay, we can then map the dynamics of the spin, <coughs> and by spatially focusing our laser beams onto our sample and by scanning the separation between pump and probe we can map out also the spatial information of our spin diffusion. So we have sigma width of spots of about one micrometers. We can scan the probe with respect to the pump and you see here an example of maps of spin polarization that we obtain at three different times after local injection of spins in the center. You see this is a measurement of 
a spin helix situation where we have equal Dresselhaus and Raspa spin orbit interaction. Again, this leads to a linear spin orbit field and therefore to a stripe pattern that you see as a spin up, spin down a stripe in the spatial maps of the spins. Okay, so now let's do that with a drift. So for this we uh, fabricate ohmic contacts. We etch a MESA structure in order to apply well-defined current, a uh, well-defined electric field that is a function of the voltage that we apply. And we map the pump probe distance along the current direction. You see here three different line scans along the y direction. You see these oscillations which are the spin mode and you see that uh, the center of these profiles shifts towards negative y direction. You see that much better if we color scale uh, this information in a color scale plot. Blue and red are spin up, spin down of the C component of the spin and you see that um, there is a center of that distribution that moves downwards. This gives us direct access to the drift velocity. This is these blue dots here as a function of the applied electric field and we compare this drift velocity with the one that we obtain from the current. So by knowing the density of our electron gas we also get a drift velocity and these two match very well which tells us that we have the electrons that we monitor here and that these electron spins follow the mobility of the electron gas. This is all as we expect. So now let's see what happens if we change the drift velocity with the spin mode pattern. We see if you change the direction of the electric field, you change of course the direction of the velocity. And we want now to analyze this quantitatively. So we fit it with the Gaussian profile that we expect from spin diffusion equation, one over t dependence of the spin polarization, but also with a factor that precesses as a function of position, which is this spin mode pattern, and we also include a possible frequency in time. And you see already here that these lines here are slightly tilted upwards, whereas these are slightly tilted downwards. You see that much better if we show the fitted uh, crossings and the green line corresponds to a line of constant phase of that factor. And you see that there is a finite omega here, which we plot here in this plot, that depends linearly on the drift velocity. So there's a linear change of spin precession frequency for quasi-stationary spins. On the other hand, the spatial wave number is more or less constant, and it corresponds to the sum of the raschbahn dresselhaus field and its size is what we expect. Okay, so what is, what is this uh, precession frequency? Where does it come from? And as I explained in the beginning, we can think of, of transport being composed of a part that is done by drift to the blue line and everything that is off the blue line is a part that comes from diffusion. And now if we have a tilt here in these lines, it means diffusion behaves differently than drift. Why is that? Let's now just do a very simple model and, and compare diffusion and drift. So in case of diffusion you have all electrons centrally um, symmetrically arranged on the Fermi circle. So the only thing that we do in the experiment is that we select out of all electrons that sit on that Fermi circle, we select those that had a finite drift momentum, a diffusion momentum, sorry. So there's something like a diffusion momentum that I can attribute and you can think of it as a post-selection. So all spins diffuse but we post-select those that were more on one side of the Fermi circle than on the other side of the Fermi circle. But all of them had the same momentum. You can calculate the average spin orbit field by introducing a distribution function that accounts for this asymmetric distribution on the Fermi circle and um, I will show you on the next slide what the result of that is. The drift is very different. The drift is an acceleration of electrons in an electric field. So what you change is the position of the Fermi circle. You shift the Fermi circle and that means that there's electrons now here in this region that have a much larger Fermi, uh, much larger wave number than those on that side. And this is 
not so much a problem if you have linear spin orbit interaction, but if you think about spin orbit interaction that depends on the cube of k, this can matter. To be more precise, let me uh, do the quantitative analysis. So this is Dresselau spin orbit interaction proportional to a constant beta 1, linear in k. This is the cubic part, usually much smaller, which is proportional to a constant beta 3 and to the cube of components of the momentum. Now, for the linear part, we see that by doing the average of drift and diffusion of the spin orbit field, we see that we basically replace the momentum here by the sum of the diffusive and of the drift momentum. For the cubic part, there is a difference. You can also see that we can replace the momentum for the diffusive part, but for the drift part, we have to introduce a factor of two. So the drift part is twice as important as compared to the diffusive motion. And this is a direct consequence of the shift of the Fermi circle for the drift as compared to a no shift for diffusion. Okay, so it should be clear that this leads to, to such a, a phase. Let me just be specific. So um, if you have an electron that is just drifted, let's say at a certain time t, it arrives here, then the phase of the spin due to cubic spin orbit interaction is proportional to 4 times beta 3. So a factor of 2 times 2 beta 3. If you have a spin that you observe at half of the time, that is at the same position, it has the same distance drifted as diffused, and the total precession is 2 times beta 3 from drift, and only 1 times beta 3 from diffusion. So there is a difference of 1 times beta 3, and that leads to a precession frequency that is just given by beta 3 and by the drift momentum. So this is linear in drift, this is what we see experimentally, and from the slope we can directly determine the cubic spin orbit interaction. So we get this number here, and if you compare to what this is um, defined, so this is defined by the, um, the Dresselaus, bulk Dresselaus coefficient gamma times the Fermi wave number to the power of 2. And by knowing the Fermi wave number from the density, we can then also determine the cubic uh, bulk, the bulk Dressler spin orbit interaction coefficient. Okay, so this is um, the explanation for, for this effect. Let's now see whether this is just occurring in the spin helix situation or whether we can also do that in other situations. Now, the complete opposite of the spin helix situation is if you scan the beam and if you apply the drift along the perpendicular direction of the spin helix. So we know that our sample is not a perfect spin helix sample, which means that there is a small difference between Dresselhaus and Raspa spin orbit interaction. And thereby, we also expect a spatial frequency in that direction. And because there is a finite beta 3 also for this scan, we also expect a temporal precession frequency. None of this can we see? So this is the experiment. We see just spins stay upwards. There is no precession in space and no precession in time. This is recovered by a simulation. So this is a Monte Carlo simulation of the, of the dynamics. And the green lines are our simple model where we expect a zero crossing. So a crossing into a spin down, a blue color. And this doesn't happen. And why not? This is because this spin helix um, symmetry stabilizes our spin mode and that means that if you plot for instance the spatial wave number as a function of the Raspa parameter you see that in the persistent spin helix case we expect from this equation that the spatial period is just zero but if you go away it stays zero we have a stabilization this is the Monte Carlo result that we obtain and there is another situation in between, of course. So these are the two extremes. Now, for all other situations, um, this works well. And this is a test that also shows that the simple model of, of just averaging the Fermi circle also works um, if you do a more sophisticated Monte Carlo approach. So these are data obtained with a Monte Carlo simulation of the spin dynamics. And the green lines are the simple model. And you see that they fit for everything between a symmetric spin orbit case where you have only Dresselau spin orbit interaction all the way to this 
spin helix situation where you have just seen the measurements. So let me now switch gears in the last two minutes and show that this post-selection by placing pump and probe spots at different positions leads to a selection of a certain velocity. And this velocity leads to spin-orbit interaction. And so that gives us a possibility to determine spin-orbit interaction without any applied drift or any applied current by just selecting different pump and probe positions. So this is a measurement where we have a rather large pump spot, so we don't resolve the spin mode, and we probe at different positions. And you see, if you probe at different positions, you see if you look in this corner that the precession frequency changes as a function of position. And that is just a consequence of this velocity. And if we plot the spin precession frequency as a function of overlap position between pump and probe, we see that there's a linear dependence. And by scanning along two different directions, we can directly map out Dresslaus and Raspa spin orbit interaction. You see here the results of a series of measurements on three samples. These are quantum well samples of different width. There we expect that the Dresslaus, linear Dresslaus spin orbit interaction scales with the expectation value of the square of the wave number along the z direction. And you see that this is more or less the case. And because these samples were symmetrically doped, we expect a small Raspa spin orbit interaction, which you also see. So this post-selection by changing pump probe overlap um, gives a possibility to measure directly spin orbit interaction without any spatial resolution and without any drift applied. So let me conclude. So stationary spins um, do precess if you have cubic spin orbit interaction. This uh, is validated by a simple model and by Monte Carlo simulation and allows you to determine cubic spin orbit interaction directly. It may also be of relevance for applications if you think about the spin precession of local spins which depend on the current that you apply. So usually you have the problem that if you inject spin somewhere and you detect it somewhere that the spin phase just depends on the distance but not on the current. But here you have a mechanism that allows you to control spins by changing the current. Since I'm at a conference here for uh, quantum acoustics, I want to also share with you that we are considering um, to use surface acoustic waves not only for drifting spins around, but also study the coupling of the surface acoustic modes with the spin through spin orbit interaction. With that, I thank you for your attention. Any questions? I want to uh, comment on the effect of the speed turn on the, uh, the lifetime of, of, of the transport length of, of the spin helix effect because now you, you want to comp uh, not comp not completely compensate the rational transport length. So you are asking about the spin lifetime and whether this is influenced by by, by a drift that you apply. So we don't see a defacing of the spin, an additional defacing of the spin if you apply the drift in that range that you have seen here. So the spin lifetime stays on the order of one nanosecond and this is more or less what you expect from the cubic spin orbit interaction. So this is what we expect from the model and it also tells us that we probably have not much heating from that current. So there is quite a strong uh, voltage, quite a large voltage that we apply in order to, to make these electrons drift. And we may worry about heating of the electron gas, but that doesn't... So what, what will you see your, your spin lifetime in, in, in the spin lifetime? So you, you mentioned that, of course, the Raspa and Treffels, Teslas are not completely matched. So that is one component that is from the linear term of the, of the Dresslau spin orbit interaction, but that is the smaller component. The more severe component is that there is cubic spin orbit interaction and this cubic spin orbit interaction is the main lim limiting mechanism. So this one nanosecond is completely explained by our density and our cubic spin orbit interaction. So, so you're looking at long time, the measurement is in equilibrium. Uh, so by very short passes, don't you locally change the 
you know, the heat distribution, and then you have some yes. you know, dynamics, can yes. you focus? So that, that we that we could probe and we try to avoid it. <laughs> so we know that in the beginning the data does not fit the simple model. There is heating, there is due to the heating of the electron gas also a shift in the care spectrum. So the relation between care rotation and spin polarization changes because we have a, a shift of, of, of our function that determines the care rotation. So this is a regime, the first, let's say, 100 picoseconds is a regime that we uh, do not use for the fits here. So this to be on the safe side. But there is work, of course, that tries to investigate exactly this dependence in terms of, of seeing how, how heating affects the electron temperature. Any other questions? Have you tried other materials? Yeah. Yes, so, so these, these experiments are all uh, done in gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide quantum wells. We have started working on, on low band cap materials, so indium gallium arsenide or gallium antimonide samples, where we use, however, not the Titan safe sapphire laser, but an OPO to, to access it. Okay. If there are no more questions, then I'll just thank the speaker.